think I see it now. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Wait. you can just go to presentation mode. It would be nicer. Thanks. Yeah. So, okay, thank you very much for the invitation to have a talk today in the EMEA member meeting. Um, my name is Irina Sens. I'm head of the library services of TIB, the German National Library of Science and Technology, which is located in northern Germany. Um, I'm very happy that my colleague Britta Dreyer and also the other colleagues from TIB here on the call, though we have uh, several colleagues who can answer questions for the process to build a data site consortium. Um, um, TIB is a founding member of DataSight, but we provide DOIs for research data since 2004, and then we asked several large institutions all over the world to build with, up, with us uh, DataSight um, in 2009, which is now such a success, um, which Matt uh, mentioned. TIB is running also the DataSight administration office. Um, Britta Dreyer is uh, here the lead. And she's also on the call and can um, ask questions. Um, to build a consortium, consortium at TIB is a, very, is a little bit tricky um, because we are not building from, the, from, a, from scratch a consortium, but um, the change of the uh, business model of data site, which is really supported by TIB, it was not a problem to support the, day, the new model. We see the need of the new business model. But um, up to now, we are, uh, so have 290 data centers or repositories in our subject fields, which we serve with um, providing DOIs. And it was free of charge in Germany since 2012. There was an agreement of the five members in Germany, um, which are the uh, subject libraries, ZBW, um, ZB Made, um, Jesus, and um, SOB Göttingen, Jan Braz is also on the call, that we want to spread UIs and to give more um, attraction to research data and to make them citable, that we decided in 2012 to provide the service free of charge. Before that, we, have an, we, had, we had a fee for um, UI registration in Germany, but to uh, bring institutions from a free of charge model to a, a paid model is not so easy. But um, the process is successful, so we have a two-way strategy. We asked our largest data centers on, and universities to become direct member of a data site to get, um, have more visibility and to have more influence on, on data site. And the smaller members we offer to build a consortia with us, and up to now, this process is um, successful. We have consortium members several times. We have universities, we have research institutions with a focus on natural science and technologies because these are the subjects which are um, served by TIB. I have to say that we these five early members of data side of TIB, we had a um, subject-oriented responsibility. So TIB was responsible or is responsible for, or was responsible for engineering and natural science, and the ZBW perhaps for um, economics. Up to now and today, I signed three more contracts, more than 50 consortium, and we have more than 50 consortia members. So as you remember, we had 290 um, repositories and now we have a contract with 50 consortium members, but the process isn't closed. So by the end of the year, I think we, we will have um, some more. And if you um, see the mail, if you read the mails which Matt regularly sent that new, we, uh, new members are applying for data site, there are several German members are there which were um, part of the TI, which were a research center or a data center of TIB. Um, there are, as you know, if you build also a consortium, there are some challenges. And as I mentioned, the transition from a free of charge model to a price model is not so easy. The other way around is easier. That was a great success, but it's not with a new business model. It's not payable by, by TIB. And the other challenges is that we have a lot of um, a third of our uh, data centers or organizations which register less than 100 UIs annually. So we have to find a model with them that they 
uh, have can pay that um, and that they do not say okay that doesn't is, isn't worse for us and we will uh, leave the um, TIB consortium or use other uh, PIDs like URNs with what was a discussion discussion in Germany and we wanted uh, not to go back to that. So we end. Um, we had contracts with our um, data centers because uh, they have also some duties and we have to bring them all together with, uh, we have different cancellation notice periods and we have to bring that all together. And so we um, need also more resources to do that also from our legal department, but also from um, our PID department, PID and meter detail uh, department to handle that process. So it's a busy year for us to bring that all in line, um, but we are we are on a good mood. We, so we started the conversations with our repositories last year. It's, I think but it's around about a year ago that we started the process and we canceled and that was very, <laughs> that was not so easy because if you send a letter to all your members or to all your data centers that we cancel all existing contracts, um, that's not that's not so easy to read for the institution. So they say, okay, what is happening? And it was, I think we, it was a lot, very long letter and to convince them, okay, we will build a consortium and it, but we have to cancel now the contracts. And we had a very successful workshop in February together with um, Helena and uh, Martin, um, Helena and Matt to discuss that with, uh, with the institutions and to, um, tell them what happens, why, why the process is so going on, why we have the new business model, what are their possibilities to become a direct member to, for, of data side or to become a consortium member. And we worked with our legal department to set up the new contracts um, with, for the consortium and to bring that all in line. Also with a consortium contract with um, data side. So we, um, when the General Assembly decided that we um, change the business model, we started a, a new communication round with all our data centers, which is now always called repositories on, and organizations, but early in earlier times, we talked about data centers. And um, we informed them about the a new business model and the price model. Um, it was a little bit late because we got the decision relatively late. We um, informed them also if they um, have DOIs mostly for text materials to um, prove the Crossref membership or to go to um, other consortia or asking and ask them for a decision. And we will have a second workshop, workshop in November to bring that all in line and to inform them. And uh, we are working also with data side to bring the new consortium structure in, in Fabrica and transfer bring them all to this um, consortium uh, structure. And we have a, a special requirement because we have also um, not only a lot of institutions who register less than 100 UIs, but also um, institutions who register less than 25 DOIs per year. And for them, we found a special business model um, to have a joint account with TIB to bring them also in the consortium and, and not to lose them. So what is a consortium lead activities? And we have um, our, I have my staff here on the, on the call. They can tell us, you uh, tell it in detail. So it's to set up the administrative process for all the billing and so on. We need more so a service structure as a consortium lead. We have to support them also in our language, in German language, not only in English. So we can use um, data side material, but all, often we have to translate it and to have a two-way conversation. We have to a consortium assembly with our consortium members to get feedback and um, to involve them in the processes of data side. And there's a national program in Germany, um, very successful, hopefully the German national research data infrastructure. And we want to establish that um, also the use of DOIs and get more consortium members there. And to grow the consortium is also a goal of us and uh, we have to uh, reach that also. So that's all. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in the breakout session. 
Thank you, Ina. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can, uh, we are now ahead of time, which is good, uh, but we can jump to the next, uh, next talk. And that's from Nick Shepard from the University of Leeds. Uh, I guess, uh, Nick, you can share your screen here. Hello, yeah, hang on, bear with me. Thank you. So hopefully that's worked, can you see yeah, it? Yeah, I can see it, yeah, thanks. So um, thank you for inviting me to come and speak to you today. So my name's Nick Shepherd. hang on, just bear with me and find me buttons. Um, I'm... Uh, Open Research Advisor at the University of Leeds and talk to you today about metadata reuse of Wikidata. Um, why I think it's perhaps a good idea um, for us as a community to uh, perhaps explore uh, doing it more systematically uh, and a little bit on how, but I will say at the outset that I don't regard myself as anything like an expert in this area. I'm still, you know, on the lower slopes of the learning curve myself, as it were, but hopefully I can tell you a little bit about what I've learned and um, as a basis for a discussion in the breakout and afterwards. So um, I'm sure, well, I know everybody will be familiar with Wikipedia as the um, free online encyclopedia. What you may be less aware of is that actually Wikipedia is just one of 16 interconnected projects um, under the Wikimedia umbrella. Uh, so you, the other one you've perhaps heard of is Wikimedia Commons, which is a repository of openly licensed media files, so photographs, diagrams, video, audio files um, that can be used embedded on Wikipedia, but can also be used elsewhere. So they, you know, people use them in Latin education, for example. So similarly, Wikidata um, is a store of structured data that um, uh, also underpins Wiki, Wikipedia but again, can be used elsewhere. Um, it can be read and edited by humans or machine and it interlinks with the various other projects, most notably in the context I'm talking about today, Wikimedia Commons and Wikipedia. So Wikidata is what's known as a knowledge graph. Um, so it represents uh, knowledge through connections between things. So on the right hand side there, you can see the data model um, with the Q code. So every item in Wikidata has a unique identifier, a Q code. Now, anybody that's familiar with uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will recognise the significance of 42 for Douglas Adams, which is used as the example there. But if you think of a research paper um, as an example, it has an author who has a nationality, a name, a date of birth. They graduated from a particular university, which in turn has a geographic location, a vice chancellor, other notable alumni and so on. So. Um, Increasingly, Wikidata is becoming um, a hub to connect identifiers from thousands of disparate systems, and those in turn can be queried by the database language Sparkle to answer all sorts of questions and build data visualizations. Now, if you're anything like me, uh, I struggled, it, it can be a little bit abstract, so, so hopefully you can still see this, but I'll show you a couple of examples. Is that okay? Can people see that? We'll never show with some. Yeah, you can see it. So this is a great example from Edinburgh. Um, so this is uh, a data set of uh, witches, um, uh, places of accused witches, uh, places of, you know, such things witches, of course, even in Halloween, um, uh, uh, accused women in um, uh, Scotland. So they, this data set was uploaded to Wikidata and um, you can then visualize it by querying it via Sparkle on uh, this map. I'm just highlighting Isabella Young there because a colleague and I actually went to an editor-thon um, at Edinburgh, and uh, my colleague added the um, Wikipedia page for Isabel, um, and this is the Wikidata item for Isabel, uh, which is where all the data, so I added the date of birth, for example, which is then used to populate the map. Another example you may be familiar with is Histropedia. So this is something I did on another project, Electrifying Women, which is um, uh, women in engineering. So again, this is generated from Sparkle. Again, don't ask me how, you know, I'm not a, 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 a I can't write Sparkle myself other than the very basic queries. But um, it's uh, generated by, by Sparkle again and again. This is Ada Lovelace's um, Wikidata item. And again, there you can see, so this is the image that's pulled through there, etc. And uh, the um, 
that will also link off to her um, Wikipedia pages and all the different languages that she has Wikipedia page in, so that there's Ada Lovelace. And every, if you look down the right hand or the left hand side of a Wikipedia page, you'll see the um, wiki data item there. So everything's interlinked in that way. Final example, which is just a very basic Sparkle query for, so what you're looking at here is uh, Wikipedia articles of people whose doctoral theses are available, full text in the white rosy theses in repository, so that's our e-theses repository. So again, it's a very basic query in the Wikidata query uh, service to, 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 to give that um, information. So, go back to the slides. So, um, at the crucial point where I started having discussions with DataSite and, you know, thinking about what we might want to do with this was the fact that all data in Wikidata is published under uh, CC0, um, Creative Commons Public Domain Dedication, such that it can be copied, modified, etc., um, even for commercial purposes without asking for permission. Now, I was struggling at Leeds to get sign off that our data was indeed CC0. Um, so I went to DataSite and asked if their data was CC0. Now, it's always been openly available, but it wasn't formally licensed under CC0. Um, and I now understand after the conversations and you know, around this, these potential use cases that it will be made available, the data file will be made available under a CC0 license, uh, which is obviously essential that it can be explicitly licensed in those terms for use it on Wikidata. Just to say as well that you know, the context I'm coming at this from is from the context of open research, which is of increasing importance in universities. And um, though it's largely driven by the reproducibility or the replicability crisis, you know, such that um, a lot of research apparently can't necessarily be reproduced. Um, I think for libraries, uh, there's a big part of uh, increasing impact as well and um, ensuring broader contribution to society through things like citizen science. And in terms of an open infrastructure, I think Wikimedia really lends itself to this sort of endeavour, you know, in that it easily enables research outputs, media, digital assets, etc., to be distributed at scale with clear provenance and copyright and linked back to institutional systems via uh, persistent identifiers, in this case, obviously, DOIs via the data side. But that's kind of the angle um, we're coming from. So, in uh, 2018, I think, we started thinking about this. Um, we uh, won a small uh, award from a competition run by Cambridge University along with Spark and JISC, manage it locally to share it globally, which was around linking research data management with the open science movement via the Wikimedia suite of tools. Now, at that time, I was primarily thinking about Wikimedia Commons. Um, and as I say, you know, I've been on a, a sort of long journey curve with this. I went up to Edinburgh. They've done an awful lot of work at Edinburgh around Wikidata, uh, well, Wikimedia generally, uh, both in terms of Wikidata and research, but also teaching and learning, information literacy, and that kind of thing. It's very, it's worth a look if, you, if you're not familiar with the work they've been doing. I've had a lot of help as well from Martin Poulter, who I'll just name check here. So he's, or he was, I think they've now discontinued the post, but he was Wikimedia in residence at the Bodleian in Oxford. It's interesting as well, I won't go into it now, but you know, I think with the potential of this stuff, and it's interesting that so few universities have actually gone down um, a formal path in strategic engagement with these tools, and I, I would argue the potential is, is considerable. Um, so with this in mind, we sort of started playing around with our repository. So like many repositories, I don't think we're, we're unusual in that our local repository um, is um, underused, really. Um, we've got plenty of data sets there, but in terms of reuse and, and traffic, it, it's limited. Again, we're not particularly unusual in that there's not much in the way of a presentation level la la layer. So in this case, you couldn't actually see, so that the map I've got displayed there, um, you wouldn't actually see on the record, it's just uh, a, a file to, to link to, to download. So actually this might be better if I show you. It's dangerous. So this is the, the record as if it's in our repository, obviously the DOI and the files at the bottom. So this we uploaded to uh, Wikimedia Commons. So this is a, a file, um, the, 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 the heat map in question with structured data that links back to Wikidata and uh, all the file information. So the license information, the DOI linking back to our record. 
of license information and how this is being used elsewhere. So it's been used on, that's Bulgarian Wikipedia, I believe. Not that I speak Bulgarian. Also on the English Wikipedia on the Pete page on, um, that's Irish, I think, Irish Wikipedia, and also a couple of Wikidata items. So these actually relate to um, Pete itself, so the maps there. So again, just to show how everything's sort of in, interrelated. And this is actually the article um, from which the data comes um, with its own graphic record on uh, Wikidata. And we'll come into a, a, a moment into a little bit more uh, discussion around citation information on, on, Wiki, on Wikidata and how that can be utilised. So, um, as I say, uh, that's it on Wikimedia Commons uh, and the values on other wikis, which I've just shown you and just highlighted there, the structured data is uh, um, how it relates back to, to Wikidata. So, there is a significant use of Wikidata for citation data, not just you know the types of data sets we just looked at with the witches and the, and, and, um, the women engineers, for example. And this can be queried through an application called Scholia, which is, um, again, it's going to be useful if I show you this. Isn't it? So with Scholia, you can um, generate, well, with Sparkle, you can generate a timeline of papers about um, climate change, for example, or the COVID crisis, that kind of thing. So just to show you what that would look like on um, On Wiki, on Scholar itself. Um, there we go. So this is um, again. I don't know how it works necessarily, but this is all generated through Sparkle querying the Wikidata item for COVID nineteen. So I'll give you various um, contextual information. Uh, publications per year, which as you expect in this case is twenty twenty. Um, publication timelines, that kind of thing. Author. Um, co-author graphs etc. Now obviously this isn't the only platform that is generating this type of information um, but unlike say uh, Elsevier Scopus or even ResearchGate it's not monetized in any way um, and uh, you know it's actually been recognized so in the Sloan Foundation in 2019 announced half a million dollar some funding to further development of the specific Scholia platform and um, a report from the Association of Research Libraries recommends Wikidata as an authority hub uh, as a platform for community outreach and for representation of diverse communities beyond the Western canon. So there's a lot of um, you know, interest in the potential for this. And you'll see some of the statistics there I've taken directly from Scholar on the right hand side. So you know, there's an awful lot of data already in Wikidata, including a lot from Crossref. So I think Crossref, or at least enthusiasts in the community on behalf of Crossref, Crossref have put data up there. So in terms of um, repositories at, um, at Leeds, now um, we, like many universities, have a number of repositories. We've got the White Rose Research Online repository and ETCs, as well as our Research Data Leeds repository. Now there are in fact a lot of records already from those two main repositories in Wikidata due to a colleague um, who was himself a Wikimedia and ex-colleague um, who put a lot of this data up a little under the radar before you before you know, we've got our sort of clarity on, on the licensing, etc. There's no re no problem with that. It's all openly available, etc. But you know, I've just been trying to make sure that we were doing this um, uh, properly through making sure the data was openly licensed, which we still haven't quite nailed that down for the other repositories, which is where the conversations with data side came. So we don't actually have um, many records from our research data repository in. Uh, Wikidata yet. There's one there that we're working on. So and again, we're looking at actually uploading that data set of. Uh, desertion records from the British Army actually as a data set in its own right to Wikidata along with the actual record for it. Uh, we've also been doing a bit of work with special collections so they have a repository but they don't use data site DOI so um, they're actually looking at um, a project of their own and you know we might have scope there to liaise with them on uh, ensuring that there's DOIs for data sets of theirs um, and everything's sort of interlinked in that way and how it relates to research data etc. So how, that, how it actually gets into the system is through uh, something called quick statements. Now, this is where this is kind of as far as I've got, really. So this is just an example of um, uh, a data set. So you'll note the, the Q code is there. So this is a spreadsheet that generates a, um, uh, a CSV, which is then fired up into uh, Wikidata through an application. 
uh, and then that I've used that to generate this key, key code. I won't show you now due to lack of time. But in theory, you could export, you know, data, data not metadata on mass from a repository or from data set itself and upload uh, to um, Wikidata uh, to generate in all these records, queue statements in, in, in Wikidata. Um, so that's it. Thank you. So hopefully that's just within time. And uh, yeah, interested to talk more about it in the breakout. Thank you. Nick. And yeah, uh, during the breakout sessions, there will be time for questions. Uh, there will be also each of you facilitator, facilitators of the breakout sessions will give you access to a document, a collaborative document, so we can take notes of everything. But uh, yeah, I encourage everybody to have your questions ready once we go to the breakout sessions. Uh, we have one last member talk uh, that's from uh, Bosom Obadie if I'm not missed, I'm sorry if I've said it wrong, maybe correctly. Um, and, and I think you can share your screen in a moment. Uh, we can hand up, we start the next, the next and final talk, yeah? Okay. Thank you. Oh, we can see, oh, you can see my screen. I can in it, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So you. my name is Boston Nobileye, and I also have with me here, Afis Adekoju is, we work together as a team on this project, along with all, some other people that I gave some credits to at the end of the presentation. We are looking at implementing SICAM with data site DOI. I hope within this short time that we'll be able to cover these topics and the major ones like looking into SICAM at IETA, the data repository itself, the features of SIC and ATA ITA, then we are, what we're able to do more with data sites, the impact and some credit. Now let's look into what we have. The institution has a vision and the vision is to have a repository that conforms to open data and open access. At the same time, we are looking at integrating it with the CG High AR CGIR is a consortium of research centers spread across the globe so that we can fit into the bigger repository there. And one of the major things we are looking at is to have a trusted repository that will also be able to preserve our data for a long time, be accessible globally and be fair data compliant. So, the major journey is how do we get this process repository? We started in 2017 and the focus was it should be sustainable, should be secured, should be able to preserve for long, get credit for data use, be visible, findable, accessible with permanent identifier. And that last three, those three last points, data site provides this for us. So, our second is the platform we use, and data site is a DOI. Second is built on Python. So most of our programming work they're on Python. The data site is a PID, supplier PID. We opted for data site because of the support that we're able to get with the citation APIs. We discovered that data site, apart from the fact that we are receiving DOI, is also pushing our data beyond our local portal. There is a presence of data use tracker, which data site is offering. There is available data formatter, which can allow us to be able to use data citation. We have a good support community and it's easy to use. So now internally, this is what we have. We have our internal structure of what our second is. The repository itself as a database, which has two major components, the data store and the file store. We have the web service. And then the second officer is the guy that pushed data into the application, into the second itself. Data curators create data. The data management team are the stewards that contact scientists why scientists deposit the data with us? We make our data open to the public. It is free. CC by 4.0. We 
now this is the structure of what we have within high tier for a second you can be seen as three different layers the user interface the service interface and the storage the user interface is where whether you are a back-end user or a front-end user and administrator that is where you view we have data set statistics, the access control, the data set view, analytics view, search view, and we have the APIs for the services, which are the engines that builds the system itself. We have the metadata. Second has its own inbuilt metadata, but you can reconfigure it to whatever you want. The system configuration, user management, data scheming, harvesting, logging, and data pusher. And the storage itself is divided into two. We have what is called the file store and the data store. You need to concentrate more on the backend and that's why we need to see how, what we call the data pusher that pushed service from the web front to the database. It's pushing to the data store. And then data store puts it in the database itself, which is the, the Postgre database. Second, so receive files, can flat fly structures like CSV, you can able to see pictures depending on whatever you are sending into it. So now, second and data side DOI integration at high tier. This would be taken from high level. I will not be drilling down. Hopefully, if you'll be available during the session that we have a breakout, maybe the opportunity may come. How we work at high tier is this: we have we adopt two methods of maintaining our DOI. We have the manual method and the auto generation method of DOI using our Python and data site API. At ITA, we have research databases and we have what is called the breeding databases. For instance, we have what is called cassava base, Musa base, the yam base, and so on and so forth. So for those research databases, they are semi-opened because you need to authenticate before you can access those data in the in these databases. We created an interface that allows SICAN to see data inside these research databases and then mint DOI for them within SICAN. You can access this data directly without logging in from SICAN. So that system, we use Python code in a lot to generate it. And then the manual is the one that we use whenever you are sending us emails or you are submitting your data through an app or through shared drive. In that method, we use the manual method. So that's what I just explained. The screen shows it. Data site to us, we are using it in two ways to get into SICAM. It's either we auto mint and here this is my cassava base or get data from a scientist. A little bit deeper into what I explained. For auto mining, I'm assuming we're having data coming from cassava base. Cassava base has thousands of data and we want these to come into second without putting any manual approach into it. So what we have done is to use the API coming from cassava base, we call it BRAPI. This is push along with the metadata from the cassava base, not standardized into SICAN. In SICAN, we have what is called CG core metadata. We have the version two within CGIAR. It looks close like DD high, but it's a bit different. It updates the metadata coming from cassava base and our own metadata has all the metadata feature, the schema that data site has. So through JSON, it is pushed to data site, and then we interact, automate DOI, and then it returns back to second. So that's what we see, what, that's what happened at the back end, and you just simply see the DOI minted and it's reflecting on the data within second. We also used data site to generate do high and then also to connect to to connect to the data citation. So 
sorry. To that citation. So what we basically use for that is we use data site itself, our CG commenter data, and then the cross site API. Features that we have with this IT data repositories we can include in. The IT institution repository has some features that we have built on it, which we actually leverage on the DOI that we got from data site. We the add so many enhancement with the PID, we are able to integrate with AgroVoc, and then it enables us to develop what is called tagging. So you can use different criteria to search on our second, and then it enables us to have the data citation. We can cite data, and the data is still under embargo. So all these features that I have listed here, integrating with other platforms, it is actually the flexibility that we enjoy from, from data side DOI that afforded us to do this. We did more with it. I mentioned about the integration with research databases. And then we are also able to establish multi-style data citation. So if you visit SECAN, which is data.ita.org, data.ita.org, you will realize that you can cite our data using 10 different styles. You can also do more within it because of the, the, the flexibility we have seen within the data side DOI compared to when we were using Andu, we found out that we can do more with data side DOI. So if you get to the page you, you, for a typical, typical data view, you see the data style citation, and this is our CG core. Here, if I click on the data to display, you can actually see the tags. If there's any view, people following it, we just make sure of the, the flexibility and the, and, and the, the extension that comes with the API to generate this for us. I won't spend more time again on this, but you need to see what happens with our data that is taken from Cassava Base. Cassava Base is a massive database which we work with Cornell University on. And within that database, we need to pull our own data that belongs to high ITA only without affecting other institutions or universities. So what we did was to assign what is called study ID and program ID to generate all this data. So we pull it with our codes and then, and that's what you can see with the BRAPI using JSON, it gets into SECAN. The SECAN has a staging environment in which it communicates with data site API. Remember this data is not residing in SECAN. So we push it with some codes in Python to inter interact with data site API and on communicating with that, we ask for that we need to pull the citation. So data site API in time, I mean, as communication with cross site API. And then we have the handshake and it's turned back to us at IT. So this is the real schema, how it flows. And then once you pass this stage that you can see here, it moves into something that you can see a bit. We have quality control within this process. Once we cut on the local database, we also review it through some script that we have built internally to reduce human intervention and then data quality control. Once you are in that one, then we use data site API to do the final annotation. So you can see data API, it communicates with our own CG commenter data and SICA slams it on the data within the web services within, within our SICAN, and then it's accessible. This is just the real flow of the data for anyone that wishes to implement such. And at the end, we have better impact. Our scientists used to be, I mean, they are not supportive before, but when scientists begin to see that their data is getting visible and they're having some credits, we got more acceptability and 
we got more visibility within CGI, our big data platform called Guardian. We plan to comply with fair data principle and within Guardian, there is a tool that rates data, data compliance with fair principle. Initially, we were within 3.9 out of five, out of four. No, we were initially 2.9 out of four. Then we jumped to 3.2. As at a month ago, IATA is about 3.9 out of four in terms of fair data compliance, meaning that we have really improved on it. So we got more partnership. We also got more funding as a result of what we are doing and it enhanced our data management practices. I need to give credit to all these people that we have worked together along the line in fulfilling this project. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Balsam. That was very interesting, thanks. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, 